It's Sunday, November 8th, 2020. Welcome to Virtual Worship with the First Presbyterian Church of Mount Vernon, New York. We are thankful for all of you joining us from wherever you are in the world. I am Elder Lloyd Johnson, and although the church has left the building, Christians all over the world, because we have a will, have found a way to gather together in that precious name of Jesus. Would you pray with me? Lord, once again, we are thankful that we have come this far by faith leaning on your everlasting arms. We live with confidence that you will, that you never fail. Send your spirit to be with us as we worship you today in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name, amen. We are called to worship. People of God, listen. The Lord has done marvelous things. So teach your children all that God has done so that they may live in hope and die in peace. Let us worship God. Brothers and sisters, hear the good news. Nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Believe the gospel. We are forgiven. Let's virtually pass the peace to one another. Let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. And to, to this peace, we are called as members of a, of a single body. May the peace of Christ be with each of you.
let's bow our heads and lift our hearts to heaven as we pray the prayer of the people. Almighty and eternal God, God in heaven, once again on, on, on bended knee, we come in awe of your majesty. Hallowed be your name. With contrite hearts, we have asked for and received forgiveness as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Lord, we, we, we just want to thank you today. Thank you for this new day, a day we have never seen before. A day which holds promise of every good thing. A special day of worship as we observe another another Lord's Day. Thank you for opening our eyes to this new day and opening our hearts to new possibilities and opportunities to love our neighbors and feed the hungry and give shelter to the homeless and welcome the stranger and give real hope, help to the helpless and tell the hopeless about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray for people all over this world who are suffering from this current pandemic and from other illnesses and injuries. Lord, there are those who are suffering the ravages of, of, of earthquakes and tornadoes. And, and we pray that, that they will come through them safely and that you will see them through. We especially pray for the medical workers and the miracle workers and the caregivers who unselfishly give of their time, their talent, and other resources. We pray for the members of First Presbyterian Church of Mount Vernon and the members of the Church of Jesus Christ around the world. May they not waver in their zeal for the gospel and their willingness to work under the most dire of circumstances. Hear us now as we pray the prayer your son taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's join together and pray our prayer for illumination in unison. Holy and gracious God, May your Holy Spirit give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation so that with the eyes of our hearts and in, in enlightenment, we may know the hope to which Christ has called us, the riches of his glory, glorious inheritance among us, and the greatness of his power for those who believe. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our gospel lesson today is Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. Matthew 22, verses 1 through 14. This is the parable of the wedding banquet. The parable of the wedding banquet. Once more, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to, to call <clears throat> those who had been invited to the wedding, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves ha have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and 
went away, one to his farm and another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those invited are not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all they, that they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in, in here without a wedding robe? He was speechless. Then the king said to the, to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. This is the good news. Thanks be to you, O Christ. Let's pray. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Almighty and eternal God, let those who hear these words listen with understanding hearts, understanding hearts and minds. And may Jesus be lifted up, and we pray in his name. Brothers and sisters, you are cordially invited. Uh, before we unpack today's gospel lesson, I want to mention a few things about our Old Testament and New Testament readings. In our Old Testament lesson, <clears throat> We see that God changed his mind, but that doesn't make God fallible because he did not change his nature. God the Father remains loving and compassionate as manifested in God the Son. And in the epistle to the, to the Philippians, which we, we read this morning, some Bible scholars believe that the Apostle Paul in Philippians 4.9 was a little too high-minded, <clears throat> and when, when, especially when he said, keep, keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Who does Paul think he is? That question has been asked ab about Paul in this and other writings of his. And also let me remind you that as Christians, we, we read the Old Testament and New Testaments. <clears throat> we read through the lens of Jesus, and nobody is equal to or above Jesus. Not Moses or Elijah or Abraham or any of the prophets. Not Paul or Peter or any of the apostles. The Old Testament was translated from the Hebrew and, and, and the New Testament was translated from the Greek. And sometimes the translator has to make a choice when, when, when one word has more than one meaning. You see, we, we, see, we see Jesus when we read the, the Psalms and especially the Messianic Psalms. And this is why I prefer to to preach from the, the four, one of the four Gospels. Even the Gospel writers had, had their agendas. That's why we need to do more than listen to sermons. We need to study the Bible. And the, the, the study should be led by, <clears throat> by learned people, yet fallible people, who may have their own agendas. Just a quick example of, of word translation. 
in the Great Commission, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. The word translated for all nations is ethne or ethnos, which can also mean not us or not one of us. So the Great Commission could read, Go therefore and make disciples of all those who are not one of us. So in our gospel lesson today, Jesus tells about the invited guests who, who failed to show up for the wedding of the king's son. People don't usually fail to show up for a, a palace wedding. When, when a king's son or daughter gets married, everybody wants to be invited. It's almost unthinkable that anyone invited would not show up. For example, if, if President Obama invited you to his daughter's wedding, what would you do? The first thing you would do is tell everybody, you know who I, I got invited to Obama's wedding. You wouldn't think of not going. What strange things have happened, especially at weddings. An, an Episcopal priest once told us about one of one of the first weddings that he that he conducted. The bride didn't show up at, at the appointed time. The groom was an army officer, and the wedding was held at an army chapel. In the military, you don't just show up, and you don't just show up on time. You arrive at least 15 minutes ahead of time. But this bride didn't show up on time. The groom and the priest were awaiting nervously at the chapel, and there was no bride. Fifteen minutes before the, the, the appointed hour, there was no bride. Ten minutes, no bride. Five minutes, no bride. The, the priest finally suggested that the groom call her. He protested because he, he, she lived some distance away. Surely she was on the road. But he dialed her number anyway. And then was heard to say, Hello? What are you doing at home? She answered that she was hemming her, her, her gown. The priest told us, I, I, I could see that astonished look on his face, hemming your, hemming your dress. How long is that going to take? Her answer was that it was going to take however long it took. You might think that the bride had changed her mind, but she hadn't. She just hadn't gotten around to hemming the gown. And she wouldn't be there until she finished. The priest said that he went out into the sanctuary and told the guests that the, the wedding would be delayed. And, and he invited them to sit and chat for a while as they waited. Then he went to have a talk with the groom. And he asked the groom, are you sure you want to do this? The groom laughed and said he was sure. The bride finally showed up and they had the wedding. I have often wondered how that wedding worked out. And I, I was curious that then I remembered curiosity killed the cat. But even though satisfaction brought him back, I just, I never asked. So strange things happen at weddings. And I'm sure some of you have, have had some strange thing happen at weddings that you, you attended. You can tell us a story or two. So Jesus told this parable about a strange wedding. And if not strange, it, it, it was different. A king invited people to his son's wedding and the invited guests did not show up they gave lame excuses they even mistreated the servants that the king sent to remind them so the king punished them and then he sent his servants to invite whomever they could find 
go into the streets out on Gramerton Avenue in Mount Vernon and, and, and he said, and, and find some, some new wedding guests. So the servants went to the streets and invited everyone they saw, good and bad. Hey, man, the king is throwing a wedding for his son, and you are invited. You are cordially invited. <coughs> they filled the banquet hall with guests, which is what the king wanted. There was no way he would have a wedding celebration in an empty banquet hall. But then the king noticed a guest who was not wearing a wedding robe. Everyone else had robes, but this man did not. I got a robe, you got a robe, all God's children got a robe, except this one guy. How did he get in here? The king t t told his servants to throw him out. Not just throw him out. They bound him hand and foot and threw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. <clears throat> then Jesus concluded this parable by saying, For many are called, but few are chosen. And I wouldn't blame you if you say, Hey, Lloyd, that story doesn't, doesn't make sense. Well, the first time I read it, I thought the same thing. But we have, we have to study Scripture. We have to know something about the writer, and writers have an agenda, as I mentioned before. And words have slightly different meanings when translated. And the more you study a particular passage of Scripture, generally you will learn that it does make sense makes a whole lot of sense. Looking through the lens of Jesus, it has something important to say to us. Matthew wrote this gospel, and he, he was also a pastor of a church, and his congregation knew, knew their history. And those who read his gospel were, were usually the children of Israel. And they, these were converted Christians of the house of Israel. So, so he wrote this gospel and he gave this parable of Jesus. So, and they listened. And in this, this parable, the king is God. The invited guests are Israel, also known as God's chosen people the original invitees. The mistreated servants are the prophets, God's messengers. And Israel was known to mistreat the prophets, like Jeremiah. The people from the streets are the Gentiles, everybody who was not from the house of Israel. Are you with me so far? The king is God. The invited guests are Israel or the Israelites, also known as who? God's chosen people, the original invitees. The mistreated servants are the prophets, God's messengers. And Israel was known to mistreat the prophets. Don't forget, they ran Jesus out of town. The people from the streets are the Gentiles, everybody who is not from the house of Israel, ethnos, those who are not one of us. This wedding, then, is a story of Israel rejecting the prophets, rejecting Jesus as the Messiah, and losing their place at the front of the line. It's, it's the story of God wanting faithful people as he himself is faithful and opening the doors of the kingdom to all sorts of people to fill the banquet hall. Opening the doors of heaven. Opening the doors 
of the kingdom. For who? For ethnos. All those who are not exactly like us. Do you remember the, the anger at the golden calf people in our Old Testament reading? But this is also the story of people offering to follow Jesus and then failing to do so. Some get all excited, shouting hallelujah, and then cool off and start half-stepping. It, it might be our story. We're always tempted, especially on Sunday morning, to accept the invitation to follow Jesus. And then we back down when it comes time to pay the price. Sometimes following Jesus is difficult. Deny self. Take up your cross. The rich young, young ruler, he, 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 he said this to the rich young ruler. Sell what you have. Give your money to the poor. Then come follow me. Mm, that's kind of tough for some people. As Bishop of Atlanta, Will Willimon told of, of, of a man under his charge who's, who told Bishop Willimon not to worry about the low salary he was receiving. He said that he had been in a job where with a six-figure annual income and when Jesus called him to quit that job and go to seminary. And sometimes following Jesus involves real sacrifice. There have been people <clears throat> that Jesus has called to quit whatever they were doing and go into the ministry. Maybe it's not one of us, but he has called every one of us to faithful discipleship. Yes, he has. Every one of us he has called to faithful discipleship. And what does that mean? It means that Jesus has called us to be faithful with our time, to devote more time to prayer, to public worship and to service in the church and take that service to the street. It means that Jesus has called us to be faithful with our money, to tithe, to support our church financially, and to help needy people. And that begins in our home church with our Christian siblings. It also means that Jesus has called us to be honest, honest in our dealings with other people, to be honest in our financial dealings, and to be honest in relationships. It means that Jesus has called us to, to live a life that will draw people to him. Live a life that will draw people to him, including our family, especially our family. I came across a, a, a statistic about families coming to Jesus when I was active in the men's ministry about 25 years ago. And I, I, I think it was the Gallup organization that compiled this statistic. And here it is. <clears throat> it's when a mother comes to faith in Christ, the rest of the family follows 17% of the time. And when children come to faith in Christ, the children in the family come to faith in Christ, the rest of the family follows 38% of the time. But when a father comes to faith in Christ, brothers, are you listening to me? When a father comes to faith in Christ, the rest of the family follows 92% of the time. As for me and my house, 92% of the time. Folks, Jesus calls us to love our family and to be kind to them, to witness to them and to be the kind of person that they will want to follow. 
And of course, it means raising your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. It means bringing them to church, to Sunday school, and to, to the youth group. It means reading Bible stories to them, and praying with them, and loving them, and guiding them. It means knowing where they are, who their friends are. Let them and let them see you in service of the Lord. Children may not do what you tell them to do, and they may do what you tell them not to do. But all children will do what you do. It means getting involved, meddling in their affairs. Who are their friends? Facebook, Instagram, and Snapchat friends. During this pandemic, meddling in their affairs could mean the difference between life and death. Jesus might want you to quit your job and go to seminary. Or he may just want you to hand some hungry person a sandwich. Listen. Listen for the invitation. When it comes, don't fail to obey because you are cordially invited to the feast. Then Jesus told about the man who came to the wedding wearing the wrong clothes. He was supposed to wear a wedding robe. But he came in his casual Friday clothes. The king had the man cast into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What was that all about? <clears throat> the wedding robe in this story stands for clean living, righteous living. The man who came to the party without a robe is like the Christian who says that he will follow Jesus, but who continues to live in sin. He is like a person who goes camping in the woods for a week and then shows up unshaven and unwashed to a black tie affair. That is almost worse than not showing up at all. In this parable, Jesus warns that he won't tolerate the person who claims to be a Christian who continues to live life as usual. He expects us to show up, but he also expects us to grow in, in grace, to become new people whose lives reflect that we belong to him. In, in this morning's assurance of pardon, following the prayer of confession, he said, friends, hear the good news. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life is gone and a new life has begun. That doesn't mean that Jesus requires us to be perfect. Far from it. Jesus wants to forgive our sins. And we all need forgiveness. This parable teaches us that when we give our lives to Jesus... He expects that we make a difference, that giving our lives will make a difference. A new life. Change our clothes and our thoughts. Dress your body and your mind. He expects us to let the Spirit begin to reshape our lives. If we insist on becoming on coming to the party unshaven and unwashed, dressed like it's casual Friday, if we insist on living in rebellion, it is just as bad as never showing up at all. I'm going to send you home asking you to do one thing. I want you to listen. Listen for Jesus' invitation to listen so that you will hear where he wants you to, to be and what he wants you to do and how 
he wants you to dress. Dress your body and your mind. When you hear his call, answer it. Come to the life to which you are cordially invited. As it says in Luke chapter 12, verse 35, be dressed and ready for service. Let Jesus reshape your life. Let him make you into a new person. If you would will be faithful to him, he will be faithful to you. He will give you a better life than you ever expected. My prayer is that you will let him begin today. The doors of the church are open. Let him begin today to give you that life to which you are cordially invited. Amen. Amen. And now here the benediction. Now to the one who, by the power at work within us, is able to do far more abundantly than all we can ask or imagine. To God be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. God has spoken, so let the church say, Amen.